Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in this afternoon, and uh, for those of you out in television, again, we'd just like to welcome you to a simple Bible study. And uh, I've said it so often, I'll say it again, we uh, don't try to pick away at other people, we don't try to attack anyone, and uh, I'm just going to teach what the book says. You know, I'm just reminded, I had a gentleman in one of my class here in Oklahoma, and uh, he's been part of the class for a long, long time. And uh, as a young man, he was a football player for one of the major universities in America. And as he told me one time, and he says, when you're in that situation, there's nothing that you can't do. But he says, you know, Les, over all the years that I've been coming to your classes, I've never heard you rant and rave against the drinking, against this, or against that. And yet he says, thanks to your teaching, that's all left my lifestyle. So what's the point? Hey, you don't have to rant and rave at these people that you can't do this and get to heaven. You can't. All you got to do is just teach the book, and uh, the Word of God will, will take care of it. So that's my approach to these things. If you haven't heard me uh, get all uptight about one thing or another, well, that's my attitude. If I can keep people in the book, the book will take care of it. I don't have to. So again, those of you out in television, just remember that's all we're going to do is search the Scriptures, compare Scripture with Scripture, and uh, let you decide what the book really says. So now today we're going to start a study in the Minor Prophets, where we started here some time ago, for Hosea. But before we go back to Joel, which we're going to study today, I'd like to have you turn with me to Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And this is just the encouragement to, yes, study all of Scripture. Now, you know, I'm, I'm so Pauline in our doctrines for today, of course. Paul is the apostle of Gentile. But see, our apostle of Gentiles admonishes us to study all of the Scripture, not just Romans through Philemon. And so that's the approach, again, we have to take. All right, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The apostle of the Gentiles... This is what he says. Whatsoever things were written aforetime. In other words, before he came on the scene. Probably even before Christ's earthly ministry. So whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our, what's the word? Learning. Now what's the difference between learning and doctrine? Well, all the difference in the world. Learning is background. Learning is to get an understanding of how did all this come about? How did it happen that Christ was crucified? How did it happen that he ascended back to glory? How did it happen that he sent the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles? Well, see, this is all background. But now for doctrine, what does that tell you? How to be saved, how to live the Christian life, what to look for at the end, so far as we are concerned, that's in Paul's epistles. But all Scripture is for our learning. And always remember that. All right, so finish the verse, that all these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we, as grace age believers now, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have what? hope. See, and the world despairs. The world is in perplexity tonight, today. They don't know which way to turn. I was reading an editorial again just this morning, which is almost a carbon copy of one I referred to in our last taping. The, the dilemma that the Western world finds itself in. We either have to go in and stop Iran and their nuclear enterprise, or we have to put up with them and then let them blackmail us. So which is worse? Well, one's is as bad as the other. So there is no real solution as far as men can understand it. And what did the Lord tell us? That in the last days, the world would be filled with perplexity. And that's the word. All right, but see, we can go back into the Old Testament now, and we're going to see how that through the prophetic writings, 
we can look at the situation today and say, hey, it's all in God's design. He knows what's going on. He's not caught by surprise. This is exactly what prophecy has told us would come. All right, so now we're going to go back and we're going to start our study. And the next little uh, minor prophet, we uh, used Hosea our last time together. And uh, now today we're going to take the next one, but like I told the folks here in the studio, don't uh, walk away from the TV set and say, oh, well, he's in the Old Testament. That doesn't mean anything to me. We're not going to stay in the Old Testament very long today. We're going to be jumping right up into other portions of Scripture. But we're going to start back here in the little minor prophet of Joel, which is probably, as near as I can determine from all the chronologies that I can look at, is the first of the Jewish prophets. He writes about 25 or 30, 40 years before Isaiah. He writes before any of the others. Maybe Jonah was a little earlier, but Jonah isn't really a book of prophecy like these are. So this little book of Joel actually is the first real book of prophecy in our Old Testament. And uh, it's going to line up, of course, with all the rest of them but it stands alone as being the first or the oldest. In other words, uh, you know that David and Solomon ruled around 1000 B.C., and now Joel is written about 800 and some B.C., between 100 and 200 years after King David. Now, as I was mulling this over again during the night, I had to think, that's no longer than you and I think of George Washington and John Adams and our founding fathers, see? They were all holding forth in the late 1700s, and uh, that's just a little over 200 years ago. So in proximity, you see, Joel is writing about the same distance of time after um, David and Solomon as we're living after Washington and the Founding Fathers, just to give you a little time element. All right, so let's just pick it up now in verse 1. Chapter 1, the book of Joel, where the word of the Lord now that means that God himself is speaking through this human instrument, that the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, you old men, give ear, all you inhabitants of the land, even in the days of your, no, hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers. In other words, there's the key. Has anything like this been spoken before in Israel's history? No. This is the first real revelation of prophetic events. They'd never heard anything like this before. All right, now verse 3. Tell your children of it. It's important. Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children. Another generation. In other words, there's another little tidbit of information. This isn't going to just happen tomorrow, but down the road, maybe several generations. Well, you know, it was even more than that. It has now been over 3,000 years, see? And so these prophetic things are written so accurately, which proves, of course, that our Bible is the Word of God. And it also shows that with God, time really doesn't mean anything. 3,000 years with God is no more than a snap of the finger, see? And so as these things are written, as we saw in the book of Isaiah, I'll go back to that a minute first. You remember in the book of Isaiah, we had three distinct prophecies concerning Israel. The first one was the Babylonian invasion, which was imminent, and it wasn't that far in the future. Then the next one was the Roman invasion of 70 A.D., after Christ's earthly ministry. And then the third one, of course, was the one that we're going to look at today, the tribulation bringing in the second coming. So you have those three big events in Israel's prophecy. Two of them have now been fulfilled. The third one is still future. Now, Isaiah dealt with all three. Jeremiah did. Most of the other prophets did. But Joel deals with one. And which one is it? The tribulation. And so we're going to be spending the whole afternoon today in studying the scriptural, the scriptural description of this final seven years of horrible tribulation. All right, reading on. Verse 4. Now here we get a little physical illustration 
that the nation of Israel, I think, suffered physically at the time that Joel is writing, but it was an indication of periods of time leading up to this final chastisement, which we call the tribulation. All right, and he uses a locust as an example. All right, verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar has eaten. Now stop and think a minute. How much is left? Nothing. Nothing. The land is totally barren of anything edible. And unless you understand the devastation of locusts in the Middle East, you probably can't really understand at all. But my, when you read about it, they could actually eat the doors off their houses. They could eat the bark off the trees so that everything died. But the interesting part here now, and here comes the divine inspiration of all, we have four distinct steps here. Look at them. The first one is that which the palmer worm has left, the locust ate. Then you come what the locust left, the canker worm ate, and that which the canker worm left, the caterpillar ate. All right, now I like to think, and I don't know if I'm on the right track or not, but you see, as soon as we get to the book of Daniel, then Daniel unlays the prophetic program for what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles. And when would it start? With the Babylonian captivity or the Babylonian invasion and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. That was the first great Gentile empire. That's the first part of the locust. The second empire were the Medes and the Persians. They overtook the Babylonians. They ruled the then known world. Well, then after a couple hundred years or so, Alexander the Great came up, and he enveloped the then known world, including Jerusalem and the Jew. All right, then after Alexander the Great de demise, then you come the worst empire of all, and that was what? Rome. And Rome also, as you well know, was occupying Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion. They were the heavy boots that the Jews hated. Oh, they hated the Romans. And so here we have four distinct periods of time that are symbolically pictured with four distinct periods of locusts. And all of it is to show Israel, as well as us, that by the time they would have gone through their time of testing and tribulation, there would be nothing left. Nothing. And we're going to see now in our scriptures that that's exactly what the rest of prophecy is telling us. It's going to be the worst time in all of human history when this final seven years comes upon the planet. All right, but I want to go ahead and uh, finish the first 14 verses before we start chasing other scriptures. So let's just go on ahead now, verse 5. So the warning to the nation of Israel, even though this is way back, 800 years before Christ, almost 3,000 years before it's going to happen. And he says, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep. Howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Shoot, there's nothing growing. There's no grapes on the vine. Verse 6, For a nation has come upon my land, a strong without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion. Well, now, if you remember your other descriptions of the Roman Empire, that was part of it. That it was beyond description. It had teeth that were indescribable. So this is a picture, of course, of the empire that will be evident when Israel comes into this final tribulation. All right, he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Now, verse 7. He hath laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree, now, don't, don't forget what the analogy is. The locusts are doing it physically as a symbol, but when it comes in reality, the whole land will come under this kind of a devastation, not from locusts, but from invading armies. Get the picture? We're using the locusts as a symbolism of what's really going to be done with the invading Gentile armies at the time of the tribulation. All right? 
He hath made it clean, bare. He hath cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Now understand what he's talking about. Why are they white? They've eaten the bark off. The locusts have just taken all the bark off the trees. Well, it's a symbolism that during the tribulation, the same thing is going to happen to everything in the physical world. It's going to be devastated, see? All right, reading on. He hath made it clean, bare, verse 7, cast it away, the branches are made white. Now verse 8, lament, be sorrowful, like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Now we just saw it happen in the news in New York again the other day where the groom was killed and the poor little bride was left without him. And it is, it's heartbreaking. And, and we see it periodically where maybe on the day of a wedding or maybe just the day after the wedding where one or the other is killed or something. And it is, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking for a young couple to be suddenly left without their mate, all right? So this is the kind of sorrow you see that will be coming on the nation of Israel in particular, but the whole world in general. Now verse 9, the meat or the meal offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. In other words, no more ritual, no, no more opportunity to carry out temple worship. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn because there is nothing to partake of. Verse 10, the field is wasted, no production. The land mourneth, for the corn or the grain is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Now verse 11, be you ashamed, O you husbandmen. Now the other word for husbandmen in my language is farmers, those who till the ground and raise the crops. And uh, O ye vine dressers, verse 11, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. There is none. Now, we got just a little taste of it here in our wheat area of Oklahoma this past year where there just was no crop. Well, that's just only one little small area. It didn't affect the whole, but here it's going to be universal. It's not just going to be a little small segment or area of the planet. Okay, now then, verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, the trees of the field are withered. Well, for two reasons. The bark has all been eaten off, and there's no water. Well, when we jump up to the tribulation, it's going to be such horrendous devastation. It'll be the same effect. And so all of this is symbolism of a reality. All right, reading on. Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Come and lie all night in sackcloth, which was a humiliating experience, of course. You ministers of my God. For the meal offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God, because there isn't anything. There's nothing to bring. Verse 14. Sanctify you a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord because of the devastation. All right, now here's the verse that I want to take as our subject matter for the rest of the afternoon. First time in Scripture that it's alluded to. All the other prophets will use it, but Joel is the first, as near as I can tell. Verse 15, Alas! For the day, what day? The day of the Lord. Now let that just ring for the rest of the afternoon. We're going to be talking about the day of the Lord. Well, now, though, you've been with me quite a while. What's the day of the Lord? The tribulation. Those final seven years of horrendous activity on the earth. God's wrath being poured out. And then according to the book of Revelation, the last half, it's going to be Satan's wrath as well. So it's going to be a double-barreled attack on the planet. The day of the Lord. Don't let it leave your thinking. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Now there again, I have to stop, don't I? <laughs> what does that hand mean? Well, it's just out in front of us. But was it? 
No, it's 3,000 years. 3,000 years out into the future. But God is speaking of it as at hand. Now, what does that show? That God is timeless. Does that mean it's not going to happen? Don't you believe it? It is going to happen. But it's going to be in God's own time. Now, you remember again when we were back in Isaiah? When Isaiah spoke of the coming Babylonian invasion, he spoke of it too as maybe in the next month, maybe in the next two months. It's coming. Israel was to get ready for it. In actuality, how long was it? Almost a hundred years. Because, see, God is timeless. And so we look at all these things the same way. My, the way it looks to us, the Lord could come tomorrow. He could come next week. Everything so far as we can see is in place. But don't bet on it necessarily because God is so timeless. His wheels grind so slowly. But it's going to happen. Everything has. When they foretold of Christ's first coming, it was the same kind of a situation. They didn't know but that it was going to be in their lifetime, but was it? Why, heavens no. Christ didn't come until 2,000 years after Abraham, 1,000 years after David, but he came. See? And how does Galatians put it? That when the fullness of time... Oh, I love it when you people know these verses and say it before I do. That when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Was he a day late? No. Nope. Was he a day early? No. So we can always rest assured that these prophecies, even though they're way out in the future, they're going to happen. All right, now then, the day of the Lord. We're going to chase this down. I'm almost, not enough time left, but we'll go back to Psalms a minute. Come back with me to Psalms chapter 2. And here is one of the earlier outlines of prophecy. You've heard me use it over and over. You know, but I always have to be reminded. Iris tries to convince me, but it's still hard because whenever I teach something the second time, I feel as though it's old hat to everybody. That's the hardest part of holding a seminar. I'll tell Iris on the way, I said, but honey, they've heard all this before. <laughs> she said, but less. They don't remember all this after just one hearing it. But to me, you do. <laughs> but on the other hand, no, we've just got to keep repeating it. All right, so I've used this portion of Psalms over and over, but I know there's somebody out on television that has never seen it before. So if you've heard it 10, 12, 14 times, bear with me. If you're hearing it for the first time, well, let me know it. Okay, Psalms chapter 2, <coughs> and uh, I guess I might as well start at verse 1, because it, it's just not fair to jump in the middle of something like this. Why do the heathen, the non-Jewish world, why do they rage? And the people, that's the people of Israel, why do they imagine the vain things? So now we've got the whole human race in the lens of our picture here. The heathen and the nation of Israel. Verse 2, the kings of the world and of Israel. They set themselves, and the rulers of all of these take counsel together. So what does that mean? Neither one was responsible for Christ's death by themselves. The Gentile world was just as responsible as Israel and vice versa because they're both involved, and you know that from the crucifixion. All right? And so the world in general, the leadership at least, they say, let us break there, that is, God's bands asunder. Let us cast away their cords from us. Now, the word cords is what we would call reins as we drive a horse. They're not going to let God control them. And then when God sees their attitude, verse 4, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Not a laugh of comedy, but a laugh of Scorn. Ridiculous. How can men laugh at the creator of everything? See? All right. So he that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and he will have them in derision. Now, I use the word perplexity in my opening remarks, the same thing. 
the world was in total derision when Christ made his first advent. They didn't know what to do with him. They didn't know how to handle him. All right? Now then, verse 5, because they rejected him. Got to read between the lines now. The world and Israel have rejected the Messiah at his first advent. Now verse 5. Then, after they've rejected him, they've crucified him, then he will speak to them in his what? Wrath. Now don't miss that. Doesn't say a word there about love and mercy and grace. He's going to speak to them in his wrath. Now, I hope my line, yeah, it did. My line came up here. See, we came out of the Old Testament prophets, his three years of ministry. And Rome and Israel put him on the cross. He rose from the dead. He went back to glory. All right, then, instead of opening up the church age right away, according to the Old Testament prophets, we're going to, cancel out this part, it was to come right into the tribulation. That was the next thing on God's prophetic program. And this is what I always like to emphasize. There is nothing in the Old Testament or the four Gospels to indicate that God's going to open up his timeline and go to the Gentiles. Nothing. Everything was to keep coming, just like this says here. Watch this. This says it all. After they've crucified him, they've rejected him, and they're in confusion. <coughs> they don't know how to handle him. What's the next thing in God's program? His wrath, because they rejected the Messiah. All right, but then what follows the wrath? The king in his kingdom. And so this is what I'm always trying to emphasize, that when you leave Paul out of your scripture, when you drop Romans through Philemon out of your scripture for just sake of understanding the old, then what you've got is the Old Testament program. Christ goes up. In comes the tribulation. Christ returns. He sets up the kingdom. That was the Old Testament. That's all they knew. Because the church age and the gospel of grace was a total secret that no one had even a clue this was going to happen. And so this is what's basic in understanding Old Testament prophecy, that it was going to come right down the line, and Israel, of course, was to have evangelized the nations. They were to be the light of the world. That's all true enough. But we got to remember that the church age was unknown in the Old Testament economy. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.